Yeah, hello everyone. How's everyone doing? Great, yeah? That sounds good. Yeah, um, my name is Jonas Pils. I'm a master trainer at Maxon, working for the Maxon training team. And today I want to show you some fast and easy VFX workflows um, using Maxon One and After Effects. And yeah, so the shot that you just saw is uh, one of the two shots that I want to talk about uh, today. And from the Maxim One side, I use Cinema 4D, ZBrush, and Redshift um, in there. Um, then After Effects together with the Red Giant um, Suites Universe, Magic Bullet, and VFX. That's um, everything I needed for these shots. And now let's have a look um, at them. So we have this coin here that has been scanned. And then after that, I have this device that I put uh, on my laptop and uh, it's bringing up a hologram that I interact with. So there are actually two main things that I wanna show here. In the first shot, let's just get to it. The interesting thing is this coin here. And what we have here is not just a coin, but that coin is um, CG, of course, and it has uh, myself on it. Um, uh, I, at some point, uh, got scanned, and um, now I have this 3D model of myself, and I constantly struggle with the question, what am I going to do with that scan? So yeah, that was one idea I had. So I have myself on that coin, and it's this uh, barrelief on the coin, and I'm going to show you how you can create that using a combination of Cinema 4D and uh, ZBrush. It's a super easy workflow. And then how to set up the material that, um, yeah, you get as many imperfections in there as possible. And also one thing that you see here is this um, light reflection of the laser here. Um, that is on a on a separate pass, rendered on a separate pass. So I'm going to show you how you can set up light groups so that you can have separate uh, lights later in compositing or control lighting of scenes completely in compositing, although um, they were rendered out of Cinema 4D um, using Redshift in this case. Um, and then in the second one, I'm going to show you how to bring up this hologram. And it's actually a mix of different layers that I rendered using Cinema 4D uh, very quickly with the standard renderer, and then added a few more effects to um, attach the hologram better to this device here, and also to, um, yeah, then I added the lens flare and so on. And there's also some, some uh, keying involved because that second hand is not part of the original footage. So, that being said, let's jump in. We're going to start with, not with a hologram, with the coin. So here we go. This is the scene that I prepared. This is the, the um, scan of myself. Uh, I was much younger, as you can see, right? You guys back, the, um, back there, you don't see me really, but I don't have hair on my head anymore just in case you didn't notice. So yeah, I'm gonna show you how you can project all of these objects onto the coin, onto that disk here um, using GoZ. And uh, let's maybe update some data on here because I actually created this uh, file in 2022. So let me adjust the year here. Let's say that's 2023. And also we are at FMX here. Isn't it cool to be at FMX? That's the point where you say yes. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we have this. And uh, a good way to check if uh, everything is gonna be in place is to go to one of the side views, uh, in this case, to the front view. And um, I have a look here. And the reason why you should do that is because it's an orthogonal view. All right, so I'm happy with this. And now I want to bring it over to ZBrush. And the way you would do that is simply by selecting all the objects that you want to bring over, and then you go to extensions, go ZBrush, and then there is the go Z exporter. And as soon as you click that, ZBrush will open. Here we go, that's ZBrush. And it will also, well, I haven't launched it yet. That's why it's bringing up all these windows and so on, and the light box that I'm gonna close. And you can see that the tool is already in here. Before I edit, 
I'm going to adjust the document size because the document size is going to be used to project all of these objects back onto um, the coin. So let me go to document. And then here, I'm just going to double uh, the resolution. So here we go. Yes, I want this. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And now I can just create this object. So I'm going to create it here, um, go to edit mode, and then I'm going to rotate it and use shift to snap to the um, uh, to the orthogonal view. And now I can scale it up and move it to the place where I want this to be. Again, the same thing that I said inside of Cinema 4D already, it's important that you're using the orthogonal view here. So ZBrush has two modes here, and you can um, activate dynamic perspective using this button here. Now it's a real camera with a focal length, and this one um, now would be the orthogonal view. All right, so let's select the background, the, the coin, so to speak. Um, I'm going to Alt-click it to select it. And also, you can see that every single object that I created inside of Cinema 4D is now part of the subtools here. So I'm going to select the disk, or I already did that. And I'm also going to go to the geometry section and just subdivide it, like, let's say, to subdivision level 6. And now the workflow is pretty easy. I go back to subtool, and then here you find this section that is called Project Barrelief. And Barrelief is exactly what we want to do. So I'm going to leave the settings at default. I'm going to just hit Project Barrelief. And once you did that, so, um, ZBrush is thinking about it, and now it's already finished. So I'm going to move this to the side, and you can see, oh, wow, now I've got this Barrelief. And let me go back to the subtools and just shift click the eye here um, to make everything else invisible. And now suddenly I have this coin, right? And I think it's a little bit too much of an effect. So what I can do is I can use the adjust last slider up here to adjust the effect. I can make it much stronger or negate the effect, or I can just go with a value of, let's say, well, let's say something around 0.2 is good, like that. All right, happy with that. I could bring this back to Cinema 4D already. But before I do that, um, I also want to show you um, how you can create a dirt map based on the cavities and also how you can um, export the displacement maps, uh, displacement map and normal map. So what I would do to get the cavity map um, is I would create a mask. And ZBrush has many tools that allow you to create masking. Um, they are in here in the masking section in the tools palette. And then it has a section called mask by cavity. And I'm just going to hit the mask by cavity uh, button and suddenly I get this. And this is the stuff that I want to bake into a texture. So I'm going to do that. Let's go down to the texture map section. And in here, um, I'm just going to hit Create, and then this will unfold this menu, and I'm going to create this new from the masking. And once I did that, ta-da, here's our texture. OK, this is the cavity map. And then I want to do the same thing with the displacement map and the normal map. If I just click this button here, I will get this uh, prompt, and it will say, hey, you cannot bake the highest subdivision level. So all right, I have to bring down the subdivision level. Uh, let's go to geometry and let's bring down the subdivision level to the original. And then in the displacement map, when I hit create displacement map, then is here. That's the displacement map. And I'm also going to do the very same with the normal map. So let's create the normal map. And this is what it looks like. These are the maps that I need. And now I want to bring this back to Cinema 4D. I could just press the Go Z button, but this will merge it with the um, project that is currently open inside of Cinema 4D. I don't want that. What I want to do is I want to create a new project, and I'm going to set the renderer to Redshift, because GoZBridge is aware of the renderer that is selected um, inside of Cinema 4D. So when I bring it over with standard renderer active, then it will create a standard material out of the textures. And if I switch it to Redshift here and merge the two, then it will automatically create a Redshift object. So let me jump back to ZBrush and just hit this GoZ button. And there we are. 
So now I have this coin back inside of Cinema 4D. I can um, yeah, just rotate around and do all that crazy stuff that I can do with navigation. And um, I can also have a look at the texture or the material here. When I double click, you can see, okay, it created some interesting things here. And one thing that is really important, and let me make this a little bit smaller here so that I can uh, zoom in. Right, so there is this ZBrush Go See standard material. And you should never touch this combination of nodes. So whenever you, for example, want to combine the, the texture map here with um, a noise in a layer node or so, you should do that after this node here. Because this combination here is owned by the GoZ bridge. And whenever you say, OK, I want to update my sculpt and then export it again to Cinema 4D, it will break the connections that you added to this side here. So everything on this side is safe. Everything here uh, will break. So keep that in mind. All right. Now let's uh, create some basic lighting already. And I'm going to simply do that by creating a dome light. That's always the light that I'm starting with. And I'm going to add a texture to the dome light to use some in, uh, image-based lighting. And um, in Cinema 4D, there is this, oh, let me make the previews a little bit smaller. Um, there is the Asset Browser. And the Asset Browser is a collection of free assets that you can use for your project. And one thing that is important to know about this is when you have Maxon 1, you have much more or many more um, assets that you can use, especially when it comes to HDRs, for example. So there's a whole HDR uh, section. Um, and let's just scroll through these and let's find an HDR that uh, could be good. So this is uh, inside, but I need something with a window. Let's scroll. And it's always good to watch the presenter scrolling, isn't it? Holy cow, is it on the at the very bottom? Well, I could use this one, but let me let me just search for HDR. It's gonna bring up all of them. And we're gonna find the one that I want to use here. That's the one. So here we go. So now we have this in here, and you can see that this huge window is pretty much in the back um, of the of the coin. I just want to rotate it. And you can simply do that using the rotate tool. Let's just rotate it in a little bit. And let me also go to four views, select the disk, and um, I'm going to hit S to, to frame the selected object. And I'm going to create an area light as well to place it here on the left, because that was the original setup for um, for this shoot. I had uh, the window in the background and another window um, on the left of myself. So I'm just going to try to to match that at least a little. So here we go. That's the lighting setup. And I think now I can already um, start the IPR here again. And let me see. I'm going to start with the dome light again. So let me just rotate this in. But what I want to uh, create and I think I already did that is a little bit of a of a rim light or something that looks like a rim light here on the right side. Yeah, I think that works quite well. And now let's do the same with the other side, and I think that works quite well already as well. So let's set up the material. I'm going to double click here and maybe rearrange a few windows here so that we can see everything, like so. And the first thing I want to do is I want to get rid of a few things in here. So I actually don't need the, the normal map here. So let me just make this smaller. And for now, um, I also don't need the diffuse because I first want to check the, um, the lighting again and I want to make this a metal object. So let me select the standard material node and let me bring up the metalness. And suddenly it's a metal. Surprise. Good. Doesn't look too bad. Maybe it could be a little bit less metalness, but we're going to adjust the metalness with the texture later anyways when we add some surface imperfections. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this back here to showing the, 
the texture that we exported from ZBrush. And I'm gonna yeah, make this a little bit, well, let's say I'm gonna adjust the colors. And whenever you wanna adjust colors of a texture or remap them or use um, or create something like a colorizer, then this can be done with a ramp node. And I'm just gonna place the ramp onto the existing wire and now um, the colors can be remapped. So the input is from black to white and the output currently also is from black to white. Um, but I'm going to remap the whites down to something grayish, like so. Maybe the lighting is a little bit too bright here. And I'm also going to bring up the blacks a little bit to something like that. And let me bring down the area light intensity, like so. And maybe also rotate the dome light. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so the next thing I want to add is surface imperfections, especially in the uh, in the roughness and also in the bump here, um, because that's something that we have in pretty much all the visualizations that we want to do. It's always really easy to create materials that look shiny and so on, um, and that make objects look like they were new objects. But it's a little bit more tricky to make objects look like they have been used, right? And for objects to look like being used, you need some imperfections um, in the surface. And that's exactly what I'm going to create. And um, there is also a bunch of textures here in the Asset Browser that is perfect for that. And let me go to the textures again. So here's the texture folder, and there's another folder called imperfections. So in here, we find fingerprints, smudges, scratches, and everything that we need. Let me go to smudges first. And let me maybe use this smudge map. Is that visible up here? Yeah, a little bit at least. So let me add this, and let me solo this node so that we can see it directly on the coin. And I'm gonna connect this to the roughness. In order to make that yeah, a little bit more uh, visible, the effect, um, I'm again going to create a ramp to add some contrast here and to, to then um, be able to adjust the colors. So with the ramp, I'm going to bring in the whites. And then you can see, once I soloed the ramp, that the color is much brighter here, especially in the yeah, bright areas, of course. And I'm also going to tone down a little bit the blacks. And if I have a look at that, you can see that actually the dome light doesn't really allow for good reflections here. So let me, so let me move this to the side. And yeah, the roughness is still not super visible, but that's down to down to the um, the light, I suppose. So let me deactivate this one. Yeah, I think now you can see it a little bit better. So yeah, there there are some imperfections going on. You can see that up here there's a little um, there's a little dot, and yeah, it's just way more interesting now. Maybe let me let me just bring down the size of this one of this light. Sorry for that. I'm going to move it a little bit to the back. Also, just to have a little bit um, darker surface here. All right. The next thing I want to add is a scratch map in the bump. So let me do this. I'm going to scroll down here until we find some scratches. And I want to use, let me see. There are some really good scratch maps. And we just need to find the one that we want to use. So I think this one could be good, but also, yeah, let's just go with this one. We don't want to waste too much time here. I'm going to use this one. Let's have a look at it. This is what it looks like. And I first want to adjust the size here. So let me go down uh, in the attributes of the texture map and let's just bring this up to two. So we have this. And then in order to use that as a bump map, I'm going to create a 
bump node, a bump map node, and use the out color as the input and the out uh, for the bump map. So what's happening right now is that all the scratches are being pushed outwards because they are white. And if I want them to be pushed inwards, um, this needs to be inverted. So I'm gonna uh, go negative with the height scale. However, let me first unsolo this. And suddenly you can see that there's a lot of imperfection going on here, um, but it's the wrong direction. Um, I'm just gonna put it to minus here. And let's just say we are happy with that. I mean, you can go on forever with this. Um, so the next thing I wanted to show here is how you would add another light and then um, export that light to a separate channel, to a separate AOV, uh, to use it in compositing for like a flickering reflection of the laser. So I'm going to create another light, another area light, make it a little bit smaller, of course, like so. And maybe move it back a little bit and up a little bit. And I'm also going to colorize it more to a bluish tint and up the exposure maybe a little bit more. That's maybe a little bit too much. However, you get the, the idea. And now I can just animate, and that's what I did, I can animate this uh, light, and then you can see that um, there is a reflection of that light on the coin. And that's, yeah, just what I did based on the um, based on the movement that I originally did with my hand in the video footage. Okay, so how can we export this as a separate channel? Um, you go to the details tab in the light, and here there's a section called light group. And you can just create a new light group. I'm gonna call it laser and hit okay. I'm also gonna rename this light to laser. And now we have a laser, uh, laser light group. And what I can do with that is I can use the Redshift AOV manager to yeah, really have it separate from the ambient lighting, so to speak. So I'm gonna use the beauty channel here. I'm gonna just drag and drop that in and select it. And here I can define the light groups. I'm gonna use the laser, but the laser is my only light group here. So I need to define what I wanna do with my global AOV here. Um, you can just say that this one contains the full lighting, that this one contains no lighting at all, or that it's using the remainder. So all the other lights. So I'm gonna choose this. And suddenly when I go to Redshift up here, go to AOVs, I have Beauty Laser and Beauty, uh, Beauty Other. And if I choose Beauty Other, you can see that this is just the, um, the ambient lighting. And if I do the same with Beauty Laser, you can see that this is the laser pass. And then I just rendered these out um, with animated light. And I also created another um, like placeholder for my hand itself so that I get a reflection of the hand in addition to the light reflection of the laser. I rendered it out and then I jumped into After Effects. And this is exactly what I'm gonna do now. So I just quickly wanna show you the, the channels that I rendered here. So this is the one for the ambient lighting. And when I scrub through the timeline, you can see that I animated this reflection. That's the reflection of the hand that I, um, that I mentioned, but there is no laser in that. And then the other one is this one that is having the animated laser light on it. And because it's a separate layer, I can just add it on top of the other. Um, of course, it would be uh, clever to do this in a 32-bit um, uh, compositing. And yeah, then I use the same expression to wiggle the intensity of the lens flare together with the um, intensity of that layer here. That's how I created it, basically. So let's go on to the next shot, which is this one. All right, this is the original plate. So I just put this object onto the laptop and then nothing happens. Right, because the other element that I was using is this hand here, and this hand is a green screen, um, a green screen element. So I'm gonna have a look at the point where, where the finger is at the most top left, 
at the maximum. And I'm going to create a garbage mat for that, like so. So now we have that method. And now I'm going to key this. And I'm going to show you the keying workflow using primate keyer. So I go to the effect controls and I just right click. And then down here, you can see that there are a lot of uh, Regined plugins here. And uh, there is one entry called Regined VFX. And we're going to use primate keyer to, use, uh, to create the key. So what is the workflow here? Of course, we have a green background, so we need to define the background color. Let me do this. So I'm going to just use this tool here and just define the background color. And now you can see, OK, that doesn't look super good. Um, I could only uh, also have auto-defined the key, but usually I go with a manual approach. So this is where you define the key color. And then you can further refine the background color, the green in this case. And then you can further refine the foreground. And to do so, um, what I typically do is I use the split screen functionality because this is helping me to, to make the key, uh, the key as clean as possible because it shows me the, the, the alpha as a luminance mat. OK, and then I can go to um, clean background. I use the other sample style and I just yeah, get rid of these gray areas here. Also, it's always a good idea to scrub through the timeline because sometimes you have some shadows in there that are making the key or that are affecting the key. So here we go. I don't know if you can see that here. Well, it's barely visible. Actually, it's not visible. So let me go here. But now the background is pretty clean. In this case, you just have to trust me. And now I want to clean up the foreground because you see a lot of gray on here. And because this is like a a luma mat, everything that is gray will be semi-transparent. So everything that is black will be full transparent. Everything that is white will be full opaque. And all the gray values will be something in between. So I choose the clean up foreground. And I just define the foreground here. And there is one situation that is a little bit more tricky here. And that is the nails, because the nails are reflecting the background a little bit. But let's just see how far we get here. OK, so this looks quite good. We've got a little bit of, of um, background here. So I'm going to go to the other tool again and just do this. All right, I think. And here, there's also a little bit of gray. But I think now we have it. That's looking pretty good. So let me deactivate split screen and now you can see this and the next thing i want to get rid of is this little green um, border that we have so i go down um, add some mat blur and i'm also going to shrink the mat so that or until the the green is gone and i think this is now quite good like so but we still have a little bit of green spill on here and everything we need to do now is to go down where it says spill color, uh, spill killer, and enable it. And now the spill is gone. So that's it. And this, in combination with another tool called Supercom that I'm going to show in the end, um, is really, really good. Right. So we have this. Let me adjust uh, the colors a little bit because, as you can clearly see, the colors of the two hands are not matching at all. In comparison with the one in the background, this one is like a zombie hand or something. So um, yeah, there are various ways of, of doing that. I'm going to go ahead and I'll go with a red giant magic bullet. I'm going to add some mojo because first I want to add or um, affect the color temperature. I'm going to bring everything down to zero except for the cool warm. I'm going to bring that up a little bit. So that's a little bit better. Not super good so, uh, though. So the next thing I'm going to add is a curves adjustment. Curves. Here we go. And maybe I bring the color, the brightness down a little bit. And definitely I have to bring up the reds. And maybe bring down the blues. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, you can also go crazy with that. Um, I'm going to leave it as is for now. It's still a little bit off, but yeah. It just takes time to 
do this correctly. And then I'm going to move it here. And what I did was, um, yeah, I exported this. And this is my, my guide layer for the hologram then inside of Cinema 4D. So I just placed that where I want um, the hand to be. It was somewhere around here. And yeah, as I said, then I exported it. Let me jump into Cinema 4D and let's have a look at this scene because this is the one that, that I did. So, okay, we have this scan again and it's here and I already animated it so that it looks like it's interacting with the finger. There we go. Swiping in one direction and then uh, to the other direction. And as I said, the hologram effect, the, the first layer of the hologram effect, is a combination of different renders, uh, renders here. And what I just did is I created two or three materials, uh, simple standard materials, because for this stuff, standard is incredibly fast with render times um, of less than a second per frame. So I'm just going to activate the luminance and I'm going to activate or going to add a Fresnel shader. And what the Fresnel shader does is basically it's creating a black and white um, shading based on the angle of the polygons um, in relation to the camera um, view. So whenever a polygon is directly facing the camera, it will output black and whenever it will point 90 degrees away from the camera, it will output white and all the other angles in between will um, create some shade of gray. So when I add this to that object, I get this, um, this effect here. So let me hit the render button and this is the whole render time for each frame basically when I export it. So it's super fast. This is one channel or one layer um, that for its own, it doesn't look super spectacular but it's already a great one um, that you can use to then layer up the effects in After Effects. So the second one that I'm gonna use is also uh, just using the luminance and I'm gonna add a gradient here. Let me just get rid of the, of the Fresnel material and let me add a gradient. And I'm gonna add it here and by default it looks, well, not so good because it's using the UV set and because this is a scan, the UV set is not super good. So we get these patches here. However, what you can do inside of Cinema 4D is you can adjust the gradient so that it's a gradient in 3D space and then you can, you can animate that. The way you can set this up is by adjusting the type from 2D U to 3D linear. And now you can see that it already created gradients from the left to the right, which is also not the way we want this to be, but we have this start and end point here. And the first column here is X direction, the second one is Y direction, and the third one is Z direction or Z, depending on where you are. Um, so I'm gonna bring down the X and gonna bring up just one value of the white like so, and suddenly you can see, okay, now we have these lines along, um, along the object. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna play with the, uh, with the gradient here, add some new knots, and then I'm gonna select all of them and just drag and drop them over to, to duplicate them. Um, this all works um, by pressing the control key. The control key is the key that you need to press to copy almost anything inside of Cinema 4D. And I'm just going to make this second one a little bit darker. Let's do something like this. And let me see that it's in the middle between the others. Perfect, I like that. Um, I now just wanna go down with the size here and do something like this. Okay, maybe I should not do that because it doesn't look good in full HD here. So but let me just show you how you can animate this then. Um, I just went to frame zero and just set a keyframe for each of these parameters. And then I went ahead to the last frame and just added a hundred to both. Here we go, two more keyframes. And then when I scrub the timeline, I have this. And because of the, 
of the movement of the lines, um, you can also uh, you also get a pretty good feeling for the shape here. So you can clearly see that this is the nose, that this these are the holes for the eyes, and so on. Um, but that's only one side of the whole scan. What what is uh, what about the back side, the, the back of the head? How can I visualize that? So in Cinema 4D, there is the option to apply a material only to one side of the object. And um, this can be done by selecting the material tag. And then under side, by default, it's just set to both. So it's assigned to the back side and the front side. If I just set this to back, or if I set it to front, you will see it, right? But on the back, there will be nothing. If I set it to back, you won't see this material anymore because it's just assigned to the back and the front doesn't have a material anymore. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to create a third material. And in this case, I'm going to deactivate everything except for the alpha. I'm just going to bring in a color shader. And in this case, I have to invert it. And I just add this as well. And now you can see that this is the back side. So I just made the front polygons invisible and the back polygons um, visible, right? It's like the inverted thing um, to back face culling, what I did here. All right. And then I rendered these, these layers out. Of course, you can add way more. Um, you can um, add like a matrix-like effect on the on uh, in a texture or so, or just like add other patterns. Doesn't matter. You can layer up as many as you want later in After Effects, but I just wanted to show you that it's pretty easy to create these separate layers and then bring them to After Effects to make something cool with them. Although um, these might not look very interesting when you look at them as separate passes. So let's jump back to After Effects and let me go to the hologram renders. So this one is the Fresnel. Oh yeah, I forgot this. I forgot to show this. So we have this effect here that is um, the whole object um, just going from very low res to high res. And this is something that works quite well for holograms when you, when you bring them up. And yeah, this is something uh, I got as a trick from my friend Peter Essany. And yeah, let me just let me just show you how you can create this. So first of all, let me have a look where the lens flare is coming in. So here we go. That's where the lens flare is. So I'm gonna make this well visible in this case, and just set to keyframes. And then I go one frame, like uh, before that frame, and I set both to off and set to keyframes. So now. It is just appearing here together with the lens flare. And then I'm going to start um, creating the effect of this being low resolution first and then becoming like higher resolution. Um, any idea how I could do this? Sorry? Um, no, it's not the level of detail. Um, maybe you could, well, you would have to prepare it manually. What I did is I used the, the volume um, workflow. So I use the volume builder and the volume measure to create this. So I'm going to throw this into a volume builder and then into a volume measure. And yeah, volumes are like 3D pixels, so to speak. And you can define a density of these um, yeah, um, voxels um, in the volume builder. So by default, this is set to 10. If I bring it down to 1, you can see that we get a pretty a good representation of the original mesh. And if I set it to 20 or so, it's uh, even less. And of course, I can animate this. And this way, I would create this effect. So let's do this. I'm going to set this to 20 and set a keyframe. And then I go, let's say, here and set it to 1 and set another keyframe. And now when I scrub the timeline, it starts with that and yeah, just brings the resolution in which is cool. OK, now let's go back to After Effects. And again, this is the first channel. Then we have the hologram back, so the lines on the back. You can see that because um, it's all coming to the top here. 
And we have the front. That's not the correct one. So front, here we go. That's the front. All right, so how can we combine these? I'm going to add this to this uh, comp here. Uh, let's just go with a Fresnel. And actually, I also need a black solid here. The shortcut for that is Control Y if you're interested in the shortcut. And then I'm going to pre-compose it using Control Shift Z. And this is going to be, uh, in this case, it's the real C, right? Not the Z, Z, but the other one. Um, so hologram. OK, I've got a pre-comp for the hologram, uh, hologram now. And um, let's build this up. So I'm just going to add in the front here. So I have this and I have this. And the best way to combine these two is by using the Fresnel as a mat for the lines. So I'm going to set the track mat to hologram Fresnel. And then by default, it is set to, um, to alpha mat mode. And I'm going to click here once to set this to luma mat mode. And suddenly, this looks really interesting. Just these two channels. And now I can go ahead and add a tint, for example. Let's just tint that in a bluish direction. And then let's add the other one, the back. This is the back. And do pretty much the same thing. But what you can see here already when I scrub the timeline is that we get the impression that there is the full um, model in, in the scene with the back side of the head. And yeah, again, I'm just going to use the Fresnel um, as a Luma mat. And suddenly, OK, that, that looks quite OK. I'm also going to tint this one. Uh, in this case, I want to go with something different, something like that. I don't know if you can see it here. Belly. However, um, this looks quite interesting already. So let me have a look at my my main composition and let's just set the mode here to add so that we have both in here. All right. So now it's looking like this. The next thing I want to do is to create a connection between the hologram and this object. And the best way to do that is by adding like light streaks that are coming out from out of here to the to the object. And here's something that I really like um, about Red Giant Universe. Uh, when you right click here, you can see, OK, there is a lot of Red Giant Universe um, menu entries. And some of them have like a lot of plugins in them. Uh, in them. Um, so I would love to have a preview of these and uh, have them organized in another way. And this is where you would go to Window, Extensions, and enable the Red Giant Universe dashboard. And I already have that in here. And the cool thing here is that, yeah, it, it will list all of, the, all of the effects. For example, um, this one, I can just hover over these and it will give me a preview. So then I can go to Glow. And there is one that is called Point Zoom. Um, if I click it, you can see that there are even a few uh, presets that I can directly apply. I'm just going to apply the whole effect. So let's do this. And now it looks like this. Great. So um, we've got the light streaks, but obviously they are totally off. So I'm just going to select the effect here and place this, um, this little, how do you call it? I don't know, um, thingy down here. All right, and suddenly I got a connection for the two, right? So now it feels like it's connected. And then there is another um, effect that I want to add here because I want this to look a little bit more hologrammy. Is it a, wor a word, hologrammy? Have you ever heard this before? I just invented it, cool. Yay. Um, so let's go with the universe dashboard again. Let's go back to the effects and to the stylized effects. And here you can see a lot of stuff again. And there's one that is called Holo Matrix. And look at this. This is something that looks really cool. I'm going to apply this effect. And suddenly, you can see that it looks even more hologrammy. <laughs> um, 
All right, let's set this up because there are a few things in there that um, I don't like too much. So here, you can see that there is a color separation. There is a lot of glow going on. I'm going to add the glow at a later stage. Um, so yeah, let me just set this up a little bit. Also, it's overriding my initial colors. So I'm going to unfold the effects here. And I'm going to start with uh, turning colorization off. So now you can see that there's a, a little bit of the purple coming back. Then I'm going to deactivate the glows. I'm also going to deactivate the interference ghost and color separation. So now it looks less intense. But as I said, I'm going to add the other stuff later. The cool thing about this is um, that it's now also creating these sort of scan lines um, on the light streaks here. I like that quite a lot. So if you don't want that, you just have to reverse the two effects. OK, great. So the next thing I want to add is I just want to add all the other elements to then comp them all together using uh, super comp. So we have the hand. And what we need is a lens flare as well. So let me create another, another solid. Again, the shortcut is control Y, and this is going to be my flare. And on this one, I'm going to create an effect from Regine VFX Suite that is called Real Lens Flares. And the very interesting uh, difference between this and other lens flare plugins is that this one is actually ray tracing lenses. So there are real lens models behind that, and it's ray tracing the lenses with all the effects um, that you need. And of course, you have all these settings here, but you also have the button open designer. And here you can have a look at all the crazy things that you have here. You can really adjust the behavior of every single lens here of the optics. It's, uh, yeah, and then it's being ray traced. Then you can add or uh, remove some of these effects and yeah, go on with that. So you have options for colors, for the amount of blades um, in the f-stop, um, you can, um, you also have um, anamorphic lens flares or an anamorphic factor for, for each of the elements. And the other thing that you have is a ton of presets. And this is not something that, so I don't want to motivate you to just use the presets, but using the presets as a starting point to create your own lens flares is definitely something that saves a lot of time. So let's go to the anamorphic uh, lens flares because what I always like um, are these streaks um, uh, through the, the brightest point. And this is something you get with anamorphic lenses. So let me have a look at these. So this one is looking quite good. This one is also looking quite good, but it's a little bit too busy here for me. Um, let's have a look at this one. This one is also okay. Let's go with this one. So yeah, by the way, let's just bring up the f-stop, for example, to, to eight, and then you see that it behaves like that. Or let me bring the anamorphic factor to something else, and it's doing this. So I have to use the point here, I guess. Yeah, here we go. OK, and confirm. So there we go. Now we have the anamorphic lens flare. And I'm just going to set this to add. It's going to be a little bit too bright here, but we're going to take care of this later. So let me bring down the brightness. And let's just put it here. And I just noticed that I'm running out of time a little bit. So what I want to do in just um, instead of just uh, animating this along with the hand, because this is what I would actually do here when the hand comes in and some, oh, come on, I'm going to do it. So let's go with the brightness of 30 or so. And let's go a few frames further. And let's animate the brightness down to zero. And then let's go here, set another keyframe. I always leave one uh, frame out. That just looks better for my taste. And then let's have a look if we are, if we need this again. Here we go. Copy, paste. 
And there we go. Yeah, let's just say that this is supposed to be the end of the lens flare. OK. Good enough for a fast solution. And another thing that I just wanted to show is how I created the, the, the background, uh, the, not the background, the, the reflection here. So in this case, that was really easy because I just had to duplicate that hand, um, put it down here. I just adjusted the scale a little bit so that it's upside down, like so. And then the rotation, I rotated it in to something like that. That's a little bit too much. Let's go with uh, this. All right, and let's have a look. So here we go. I think that's actually fine. And then just instead of adding like a, a blend mode here, I try to match it as good as possible with the, with the color and with the, uh, with the roughness. So when I used um, transparency or another blending mode, I would see this reflection through this reflection, which is not realistic. So in this case, I just added some um, Gaussian blur and a lot of it like Let's say so, and then let's say uh, saturation. There we go, saturation. And yeah, bring it down, bring down the saturation, bring down the lightness a little bit, and suddenly you have something that looks pretty um, convincing. And I would do the same here with the shadow, but we don't have time. So, okay. Now let's pre-compose all of these into layers that we could use in SuperComp. So I'm going to pre-compose these. That's my background. And I'm also going to pre-compose this one. That's my hand. And I'm going to leave the flare as is. And now I'm going to show you what SuperComp can do for you. So let me select these three layers. I want these three to be part of SuperComp. And I'm going to right click, go to Effect, Red Giant VFX and SuperComp. So what is SuperComp actually? You can think of SuperComp as a compositing application inside of a compositing application. Why does it make sense? Because After Effects is coming with some limitations. Have you ever tried to assign or apply a glow to a background layer and wanted it to affect the foreground layers, for example? That's not possible because the um, glow is restricted to that layer. Um, is there a solution for that? Yes. Um, and the solution is SuperComp, because SuperComp is lifting the limitations of the After Effects layer system. So every layer is aware of the other layers. And that's a super powerful thing. So let me show this to you. Let me show this to you actually first by creating something um, where it's very visible. So I'm going to create this thing here. And then you can see that here the source layers are a representation of the comp that we have. Um, and when we want to add it to super, uh, super comp, this layer to super comp, we just have to add the plus button. And then we have our own layer system, uh, list layer system in here. So, OK, we have it here. And then with every layer, we have this plus button. And this plus button allows us to add some effects. Also, there is a preset section, which is, uh, again, quite powerful. Um, but what I want to show you here is the difference between a layer glow, which is actually the thing you would have when you yeah, just add a, uh, a glow to any layer inside of After Effects. So yeah, you can see that yeah, it has a glow on it, but the glow is behind the hand. Right Now, instead of this, let me add optical glow. And suddenly you can see, all right, this looks much better because it's not just behind the hand, it's also glowing in front of the hand. And this is super powerful. Also, at the fingertip, you can see it quite well. You see that? This is what would actually happen when you have a bright object behind um, a non like a, a dark object uh, and film it. So this is one thing it can do. Another thing it can do that is also very tedious to do in After Effects. Let me just delete this or 
make it invisible and just delete it from here. Another thing you can do is, uh, for example, with the hand here, you can add um, stuff like a light wrap. Light wraps are also not super easy to do inside um, of After Effects. So I just add this and just for the sake of showing it, let me crank up the amount to something that doesn't look good anymore, but you can see it down here that, um, yeah, this works quite well. And maybe let me also bring back this shape layer here. Um, you can also see that it's um, interactive. So I'm gonna move this layer. Do I have the correct layer? Here we go. There we go. Why is it not working? Okay, let me do this this way. So when I move this to the left and to the right, here you can see this is a good this is a good one. Here you can see the how it reacts. Have a look at the at the top of the of the arm here of the of the shirt. So yeah, and this is something that helps you integrating your footage into any backplay because a light wrap is something that naturally happens. Um, so you can add light wraps, you can also add a haze. This is um, basically just giving you the, the background color and just adding it somehow to the, to the foreground object. And this way you can layer up all of this and make it look super great. And um, remember, uh, remember I mentioned that Supercomp is uh, really great together with um, Primate Gear. And the reason for that is, um, I want to give you another example. Just imagine you shot someone um, in front of a green screen. So you key that person and then you want to have um, a background that has a lot of lights. Like a lot of these elements that I just created. A few in orange, a few in blue, a few in, in green and whatever. Um, and you can just really integrate that person really well into the whole um, composition because the glows are working, the light wraps are working, and it's all yeah, just a matter of a few clicks. So, and another thing that's interesting here is that uh, Supercomp uh, is color managing itself. It's all 32 bits internally. So everything you do here um, is um, yeah, already doing the correct thing, 32 bits linear. So the hologram here um, already has layer type additive. So what I can do here is I can also add an optical glow, for example, and you can see that it's way too bright. Let me bring um, up the vibrance here a little bit so it looks better. But you can see that it's, yeah, it's just way too bright. Um, but using the opacity, I can now bring it down and it just looks much better compared to when I would do this like in an in a 8-bit workflow or 16. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much everything I wanted to, actually I would love to show you way more stuff, but I just don't have more time. Um, so let me jump back to the keynote and let me just show you the final result once more. So yeah, then you can see all of the techniques that I did in action. And actually, I forgot to show you one thing, and that's something I still want to show you. So when you want to add some color correction on top of all of this, um, let me add an adjustment layer, call it CC for color correction. And in this case, I want to add um, magic bullet looks. So I'm going to go to Regine, magic bullet, and looks. And what looks does is it helps you creating like the, the final look for your project. I'm going to hit edit and now you can see that we have this chain down here where we can add uh, different effects like uh, diffusions, um, lens vignettes, uh, distortions, uh, blurs, uh, shutter streaks and all color correction things and you can even um, apply LUTs here um, or halation, stuff like that. So the way it works is you just click here and it will be added and then you click that and yeah, you can just adjust the effect. But same as with the other stuff, um, the, the whole um, concept of presets and, uh, and assets is inside all of, um, of the Maxon applications. So you can see that there are a ton of presets for looks and I could just go with um, yeah, very stylized one, <laughs> this one, for example. Yay, cool, exactly what I want, um, not. Um, but 
there is also, for example, this category, Blockbuster Cool, and let's just try one of these. That looks good. Maybe this one could also be good. Yeah, you immediately get this preview. Let's say I want to use this, and let's just say I want to add another effect here. So I go to Tools and add a Lens Distortion. So I'm going to add this Lens Distortion and say, okay, my distortion is supposed to be a little bit less, and I just hit Apply. Every single effect is coming with a strength slider, and if you use the overall strength here, you can see that all of the um, all of the effects are correctly blending between each other, or between the the non-applied state. All right, but that's everything I wanted to show you 